My topic is environmental sustainability, and I hope to provide you kind of a glimpse, at least for one company's perspective on sustainability uh, for Smithfield, but also give you a glimpse into the larger industry of agriculture and, and animal agriculture in particular. Um, Smithfield is a familiar uh, company to everyone here, I'm sure. I mean, we're right across the river. Um, we're, we're a company that's been there about 75 years, started out as a, as a small local um, uh, meatpacking house and grew into a regional meatpacking company. Over the last couple of decades, though, we, we've actually grown uh, exceedingly fast, and we're now a global food company, truly. We have uh, 500 farms spread across the country in the southeast, the Midwest, and in Utah. We have farms in Poland and Romania and joint ventures in Mexico. We have 80 different facilities that process meat around the world and uh, about 50,000 employees. We're a $12 billion company, and we're the largest now at what we do. We're the largest hog processor in the world largest hog producer in the world. And our sustainability program has evolved, and I'll give you the, my first, I don't have a, I only have a couple of slides here. But sustainability for us is, has evolved, and it's, it's, it encompasses more than environmental. Environmental is the keystone for what we do, but, but it also is to, it encompasses animal care, it encompasses our employee uh, health and safety systems, our food safety systems, and our, and our community philanthropic uh, systems which focus on giving away food to needy, those in need and, uh, and in education opportunities for our employees, children and grandchildren and also in our, in our communities. But environmental is my topic so I'll stick with that. And it became, is really the keystone for us as I said before. Um, and it started back for us in the 90s and um, it, Smithfield was a smaller company then and many of you all may remember the bad old days for Smithfield in the environmental area. We were actually uh, uh, had compliance issues. We were prosecuted by the by the EPA and DEQ. Incidentally, my chief sustainability officer, Dennis Tracy, who leads these programs and is the architect of a lot of these things, was the head of the, the environmental agency in Virginia. I was with the government myself, with the attorney general's office, and worked on these cases against Smithfield. Had a bad reputation in the environmental area. It was a strong company, but it was uh, but it had a bad reputation. But the, the, the fathers of the company, the leaders, they, they decided to, be, to take a leadership role, and we, we turned things around. And we did it gradually, and we did it starting by, by adopting management systems uh, based on the ISO, the International Standards Organization system, which is most folks think is the gold standard for uh, management systems. And uh, about a decade ago, 2001, all of, our, all of our farms in the United States became certified under that system, which we were the first ones in our industry to do it, and as far as I know, we're the only ones to have, on the size and scope of operations that we have, have that kind of a certification. And then we follow that up with, a, uh, with uh, certifications for our, all of our processing facilities in the country. And we bought and sold companies over the years, but today, uh, over 95% of our facilities and farms are certified. These programs, including things like our awards programs, where we pit our engineers at each one of our plants to bring up uh, pro uh, 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 programs which are, have two, two conditions. One is to improve the environment, and the other is to save the company money. And, we, uh, and, and things like that have, uh, have resulted in huge reductions in water use, energy use, reductions in emissions, waste reductions, and, and cost savings. And it's been a great benefit for us, not only in terms of brand and reputation, but it's been a great benef benefit in terms of, uh, of dealing with our customers, the large companies that buy large uh, volumes of our, of our product. And, and, this, and the success has, has been taken, the lessons learned from that, pro that, that program have been taken to all our other areas, such as our employee health and safety areas, our animal care systems, uh, we, we're, we're modeling the environmental, what we've learned on the environmental side um, into these other areas. And in terms of what's new, in the last couple of years, we actually uh, re revitalized our program. We, ha we, we, um, we have a new, a new uh, position called the Chief Sustainability Officer, which, which reports directly to the CEO of the company. That's Dennis Tracy. I mentioned his name before. Um, and we actually have a board-level sustainability committee now, a corporate sustainability uh, in the C-suite at our for corporate parent, made up of all the presidents of our IOCs and executive officers. All of these committees and boards focus on this issue of sustainability and how to drive leadership across all of these different things in our industry. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great success for us, and we, we now have goals and targets to drive on the, on the uh, 
on the uh, successes in the past. So that's us. And I just want to give you a, a, a kind of an over, overview of what we are and what we do. I can talk about it, all these things at our tables and uh, as we talk about it further. But I was also asked to give you guys an introduction about a couple of challenges. And one challenge is, uh, is, is this. I'll go forward to that one. You all have probably recognized and read about the UN uh, projections on human population that's going to go to 9 billion people by 2050. And that the UN thinks that we have to produce a 100% increase in production of food. These graphs are taken from the FAO and from Rabobank, and they show on the left-hand side, they show the population growth, of course, to 2050, but they also show that the population is increasing exponentially in the, in the urban areas and is decreasing in the rural areas. And then on the right side, the agricultural land area is actually flatting, flattening out, and on a per capita basis, it's going down. So the problem is how you're going to feed and provide a secure future for food for all these people. There's going to be incredible demands on resources, water, uh, food production, grain, uh, energy use, the, the rising middle class as well around the world. People are getting more money. And in, in my industry, in the livestock industry, we're seeing a, 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 a graph like this in terms of uh, demand for poultry, demand for beef, pork, and, uh, and fish. People, as they get more money, they want to provide uh, animal protein to their families, and it's, not, it's no longer out of reach because these folks are, are now able to afford it. So the challenge, the, the big challenge, is how to feed everybody sustainably. And people are starting to write about this, and, and in fact, the National Academy, I invite you all to, um, to look at the National Academy of Science uh, report that just came out uh, within a few days ago. I think there was an event in Washington where this was introduced. And they looked at this, this topic. And their conclusion is, after looking at a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of, listening to a bunch of different researchers, and we were involved in this process as well, is that, is that sustainable intensification is the only real option. It, using the, the technology that, that, we, that has been really produced a miracle of modern agriculture in the United States, and put in, putting that into, a, into, the world, into the world. And using all the techniques uh, that we know in terms of intensive agriculture, whether it's grain, GMOs, uh, animal ag, and, and in order to produce enough food uh, and fiber for the, for the world. So that's, that's one issue. The other issue, and I'll, and I'll take you into my world a little bit, is, is this. This is what I see every day when I come in. You know, as my company strives to do what's right, and it try, strives to be a leader in what they do, it, it, it's a surprise to me, quite frankly, uh, and, and I've only been at this for a few years. I came to Smithfield a few years ago from, from my law firm. But the surprise is, is that there are people that want you to fail. And they, they want large companies in their, in, to fail in, what, in, 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 their, uh, in their attempts to become more sustainable. You know, in my, in my industry, there's a huge interest in food. Everybody knows about the food networks, the celebrity chefs, and everything like that. And there's a cottage industry of folks out there right now who are making, uh, peddling a lot of information and, 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 uh, and articles and books that big food, large-scale agriculture is bad. It's bad for you. It's producing bad food. And, and that's, they're making a lot of money about it. And the book, actually, the book, stack of books on the left is a, is a stack that's in my chief sustainability officer's office. And it's a, it serves as an inspiration to us when we come in there to talk about what we need to do for the day or for the week or for the month and how to, how to deal with it, and how to get the information out, because bad news sells, good news doesn't. You know, an example, an example here is, is this, and I'm sticking with environmental now. This is actually taken from a, uh, an animal research professor from, from Washington State, uh, Dr. Jude Capper. And she looks at, she looks at and studies animal um, emissions from, uh, and, and, and waste streams from uh, different types of animal raising systems. The conventional way you raise things, natural or organic ways of raising things, and, and, and in this case, beef, grass-fed. And so she took the, she took the, the view, you know, what, what truly is the most environmentally conscious thing to do? Is it to raise things in small family plots around the world, or is it better to, to intensify the use of, 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 of what you have and, small, and, and, and uh, raise things in, in a more conventional way. 
And what she found was, if you, if you tr just, and I'm using beef here, I'm, I'm in the pork business, so I didn't want you guys to think that I'm, uh, I'm being biased. This is beef. She, she looked at beef, and she, she found that if you, if you comparing conventional organic and, and grass-fed beef, if you were to actually take all of the beef in the United States and convert that to grass-fed, these are the kind of conditions in the, in, the, in the green screen, what would happen? You'd have to have additional land areas nearly the size of Texas. I mean, where's that going to come from? We're going to start using our national parks and, and forest areas. You'd have to have tens of millions more uh, gallons of water to feed them, 53 million households worth. And then you'd produce more uh, emissions, the equivalent of 26 million cars on the road. So, <laughs> um, and that, it's, that number, incidentally, is about the number that EPA thinks they're taking off the road because of the renewable uh, fuel standards that they've, they've introduced. So think about that when you, when you eat your grass-fed beef and, and, and spend $50 on it in a restaurant. <laughs> I mean, I do when I do it. It's a good thing to have, have, um, have variety, and it's a good thing to, um, to, to be able to have different things to eat. But these are the kind of environmental con conditions that arise contrary to popular perceptions. And the, the challenge, I think, to, for, for me and for us and for our industry is to be able to communicate because good news and good things don't really sell. So what we're trying to do, quite frankly, is um, be out there in the, in, in the current space, social media, just like what's, what's going on right here. Tweeting, we have Facebooks, we have new CSR reports, so it's all online. And uh, we actually are bringing, we're trying to become more transparent. We're bringing people inside of our facilities so there's not quite a, of, of a mystery to it. In fact, if you go on our site, I'd invite you to do this if you're interested. We actually have taken videos of, of every stage of, of production at our farms. So someone, if they're interested in, in the environmental controls that are at our farms, they can go and look at a 20-minute film, exactly what happens at every farm. If you're interested in how, to, how, a, how a hog is raised and weaned, and then goes to a finishing farm before it goes off to market. You, it takes a film, the, the cameras will take you in there and look at, look at those, those barns and explain what happens. So that's what we're trying to do. Those are my two challenges I wanted to raise with you guys and not to spend too much time with it. I hope it's been interesting and uh, enjoy the conversation with the other speakers.